Hey guys, welcome to the channel and welcome back to another video. Now on this video, it's all about making your money, make more money, getting started. We're going to be talking about the stock market. We might do a little Q and A at the end of this video, but making your money, your $1,000, taking $1,000, uh, it could be 500, it could be 2,000, could be 300, could be 10,000, right? But $1,000 is kind of our mode that we're going to stay with on this video, guys. What you should do with that $1,000 and how you can make that $1,000 make more money for you in the tried and true way that's happened for over 100 years in the, in the simple stock market, right, that we always hear about, et cetera. We're going to be going over a lot of stuff regarding stock market investing, the basics, right? We're not going to get overly uh, deep into the weeds, but we're going to hit kind of an overview of what you should do with $1,000 if you want to make that money grow. Let me know if you can hear me, guys, in the chat section below. Just give me a, a thumbs up or just say, yeah, you can hear me. Just a little mic check. But the point of this video is you always, always, always want your money to turn around and make additional money, right? So your money is not just to buy stuff and store up stuff and keep stuff and buy and, and have stuff sitting out in the driveway and all that. Your money is to actually to generate more money, right? Of course, you want to help people and give along the way and all that good stuff and take care of your bills, but you want it, want it to make more money ultimately in the long run. So we're going to take $1,000 and see what we can do about that and discuss it in regard to the stock market, okay? Uh, my question to you guys, as you come in, is how many of you actually invest in the stock market? Just give me, you know what, as you come in, guys, tell me where you're from, right? Like what city, state, count, country, what have you. And if you invest in the stock market, put a one in the chat for me. And if you're not in the stock market, put a zero in the chat for me. I just wanna see something, guys, and see what we're looking at here. Um, Great. All right. Glad you guys can hear me. I'm reading the chats as well. That's why I'm looking down a lot, guys, during this video. So appreciate it. You guys can hear me. Uh, we got some. Um, hey, L LD Sims, good to have you here. Good to see you again. Eric Norris got a one. Uh, Just Blaze, a one. Oliver got a one. Good. So a lot of folks are investing. Some aren't. Kim, Kimmy and, and Tahira is not, but that's okay. Preston in Kansas City, good to have you. Upstate New York. Maybe Albany somewhere up there from Molly. She's got a one. So uh, there's a lot of folks in here that are invested in the stock market, it looks like, guys. I appreciate you guys. Make sure you smash the like button below for me, all right? That really helps put get this video out because this is going to be a real basic common sense talk about the stock market, right? And about how you can take $1,000 and grow $1,000 over some time, right? So it's, it's something that probably if you're, if you're not some big time investor that has a couple million dollars, you're going to, you're going to glean some good things from this video. So, um, let's see here. Okay. So also don't forget to share this video, right? The best way to really support this channel is to not only smash the like button for me, right? But also to share the video with other people, right? Other people who could probably use this, this kind of this basic view of the stock market. Again, I promise you I'm not going to get deep, deep, deep in the weeds. We'll save that for some, some, for some other time. Um, also, don't forget, in the description box, you have a free 24 Laws of Money ebook um, that goes over 24 principles of how to change your mind when it comes to money. Look at money a little different. Please get your free copy of that. I'm not a certified financial planner. Full disclosure, I'm just a regular guy trying to help regular people understand this thing called money and putting it in plain language, not the Jim Cramer, not the stuff, not the ticker symbol at the bottom of Bloomberg TV, right? Just a regular old dude who's trying to help some other people out get a handle on this thing, right? Um, let's see here. So we got a bunch of ones, got Chicago in the house, good. Uh, Monster, I, I can't really say the rest of the name, it's hard to read, but Red Tape Tablet Talk, got a one. So we got a couple of zeros, so we got some ones. We got Oliver from Dallas, good to have you, Oliver. John Dixon from Northern California, where it's probably going to be about to get cold. Um, yes, investing in the S&P 500, fantastic. Um, and again, guys, we're going to kind of go over some things. I'll be looking through the chat. If you have a Q, a question, drop a Q. We're going to do a little Q&A towards the end of this. I did a poll yesterday on the community tab of YouTube, and I asked you guys what topic you wanted to talk about on this live this week today. And 
most of you, around 30, 325, 350 votes. And the, the thing that won out was stocks and stock market investing. So I said, you know what? That's what we're going to do today. Stocks and stock market investing, because my primary aim on the channel is to listen to you guys and provide the videos that you want to see. The, the videos that you guys think are most important for you and your life. That's that's what it's all about here on this channel. So I want to make so that's why I said let's do this video about investing in the stock market. What can someone do or what should someone, what should someone do with a thousand bucks in terms of the stock market? Right. And I know that most of the people that watch this channel, they want to grow money. They want to make more income and they want to have more income in order to retire and do the things they, they enjoy and love doing. Right. So stocks and stock market investing is definitely a way to build that wealth and have more money to do so and build up your money. Right. So this topic right here is right up our alley. So let's let's get into it. So I want us to think about, like I said, an additional one thousand dollars that any of us could have. Right. And I, I think I'm going to be doing more videos about the stock market investing and stocks in, in general, guys, because, you know, uh, just a couple of days ago, let me just full disclosure again, just a couple of days ago, I went shopping, right? And when I say shop, shopping, let me, let me, let me understand, let you understand. I don't, I'm not a big shopper, but when I say shopping, I went, I mean, I went to the, the stock store, so to speak, right? In other words, I was online buying stocks and ETFs and in, index funds, et cetera. And I said to myself when I was, buying stocks at the stock store, so to speak, the metaphoric stock store. I said, I need to bring my audience and subscribers into this mix and share this with you guys, right? I shouldn't be out here buying stock. I want to I bring you guys in behind the scenes and say, hey, what is he investing in? What, why is he investing in, et cetera? So let's, let's talk stock market on this video. Hey, we got East Texas in the house. Good to have you. All right. Fantastic. All right. All right. So if we have a thousand dollars, just jump into it. If we have a thousand dollars, we need to first don't let the thousand dollars burn a hole in our pocket, right? We need to answer a few questions first regarding our thousand dollars and the stock market. Now, this is suggestion number one, and it comes automatically pretty easily. My first suggestion to you, if you have one thousand dollars to invest, is I suggest you make sure you invest in the stock market right? Duh, right? I want to make that clear that the stock market is a good place to invest your money. Now, why is the stock market a good place to invest your money, right? Um, why not take that $1,000 and simply put it into a high yield savings account that's getting you four or four and a half percent, especially when we see stocks going down, right? I want to get return on my money, so I want to get my four percent, right? That's the opposite of how you should be thinking with the stock market, right? <laughs> you know, the stock market is going to add a little additional risk, right, with it. Uh, but I believe that you should be putting your money into the stock market as opposed to a high yield savings account, even if the high yield savings accounts getting four percent, which, you know, three years ago, those high yield savings accounts were getting point zero five percent. Right. But why? And by the way, uh, let's see here. Let me just run through. Oh, OK, great. Just checking some. So. Why would you want to take the additional the additional risk of putting it into the stock market as opposed to something super duper uh, safe? Right. Let's first talk about what is the, you know, kind of like what's what is the stock market? I don't want to go way back down to those basics, but what's what's in it for the companies? Right. The stock market, uh, it flat out allows companies to pretty much raise money. I'm going to just give you a, a few things to think about differently when it comes to the stock market. So the stock market is allowing these companies to raise money by offering their stocks, uh, uh, stock shares and corporate bonds, et cetera. Companies need capital, guys. Capital is money, equipment, uh, you know, land, machinery, whatever it may be. Labor is capital, right? But what it, those, those are the things that it takes to run a company, a successful company. Companies need to operate with capital. And so stocks and things like that, that helps them raise capital. Bonds helps them raise capital as well. Capital and access to capital is what these companies, helps grow these, company, these companies, right? If the property, if the, the, uh, the capital is properly managed, right? We see some mismanagement going on with some companies and it ultimately shows up, right? But stocks and bonds do that for company. Uh, when, co when a company sells stocks on a primary stock market, the prime, okay, the primary, there's two different stock markets, guys. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the primary stock market is where the institutionalized, institutionalized, institutional investors, 
That's where they actually invest. So when a company does something like offers an IPO, right? When they offer an IPO, me and you can't get into the IPO and, and, and buy at that point. That's the primary market, right? So that's the primary when investors, big investors, when I say in institutional investors, I'm talking about the investors that got $100 million, $100,000, $600,000, 2 million, 10 million, 11 million, 15, 30 million, 50 million to put into a company. When a company first puts themselves out there to go from private to public, they put out an IPO, the big institutional investors come out and support and buy, and that money goes right into the hands of the company on, from the primary market. Now, when we come along as little guys, right, regular investors like me and you, we're buying shares of stock, but we're not buying them directly from the companies. We're buying them from the institutionalized investors. So we're getting it on what's called the secondary market. I don't want to go too deep into that, but just so you guys understand the primary market versus the secondary market, right? So also when a corporation, a corporation needs to sell bonds, right? A corporation can sell bonds and they get money in return, right? When it, so these are just some basics that you guys got to know that, you know, there's institutional investors, right? And then there's us. Institutional investors would be like if, you know, a big firm or big company or big time person wants to invest, right? They, they get the initial public offering, right? The IPO, right? So also keep in mind that when a company uh, goes public, or, or, and they sell, the, they sell their shares, they go from a private company to a public company, it allows for some transparency, right, in a publicly traded companies because then we, as either institutional, institutional investors or us regular investors from the secondary market, we get a chance to kind of see the books of a company to decide whether or not we want to invest our money with that company, right? Now, what's in the stock market for us investors, right? Us investors... Stocks allow us to participate in the what's called by some people the financial achievements or the financial downfall in a company if we're not careful, right? The things the company that's doing the company what the company's doing right to grow and expand, right? It gives us an opportunity to partake in that by owning a, a small piece of share in that company, right? It helps us kind of participate in the company's growth. And we make profits through capital gains and, and so forth, right? And unearned income through dividends, right? Lots of good benefits for us and for investors who want to stick this thing out over the long period because I'm a believer in the buy and hold strategy, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, we are generally rewarded with positive returns. Generally speaking, we know there's some problems and issues when companies belly up, companies lose money, companies don't grow as fast. We get it. It happens. But over the long term, and this is why I believe in long-term investing, we generally win if we're well diversified, which we'll talk about in a bit, right? But stock prices move down as well as they move up. We know that. There's risk involved, right? And I'm going to show you a chart in a little bit to kind of bring this home right? But I like buy and hold. So with your thousand dollars you have to initially invest, be thinking buy and hold. Don't be thinking I want to day trade this thing and day trade this thing and day trade this thing. And next thing you know, my, my thousand dollars is whittled down to 700, but I'm still day buy and hold. Stocks can be a really important part of an, of your overall investment portfolio, right? And if you're an investor, most of you said you put a one in the chat. If you're an investor, you got a portfolio. I don't care if the portfolio is worth 300 bucks. You got a portfolio, okay? Owning stocks in different companies help to build our savings and build our investments and protects our money sort of from, from inflation as well and sort of taxes, the, 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 highest, the highest taxed type of income, right? So the money you make on your investment when you sell it for more than you bought it, that's capital gains, and it's subject to capital gains taxes and all that good stuff. Not going to go deep there. Um, but again, it's important to know that there's some risk. And also, guys, before you do anything with your $1,000 or your $10,000, know your risk tolerance, okay? Know what you can stomach and know what you can't stomach, okay? So I want to point this out. I also want to point this out. Money goes down in value, when you hold on to money, you're exposed to inflation. 
That erodes the value of your dollar that you have in your hand. When you invest in the stock market, however, you provide sort of a hedge against that because you're hopefully growing your $1,000. So now if inflation, okay, $1,000, if inflation is 2% after a year, if you got that $1,000 under your mattress after a year, your thousand dollars is now only gives you buying power of of about two nine 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 thousand nine hundred eighty i think after one year right because of inflation but if you grew that thousand dollars by putting it in the stock market right let's say it grew by ten percent it was a good year in the market ten percent right then it's not nine thousand nine hundred eighty right it's the thousand dollars plus ten percent which is eleven hundred dollars minus the two percent inflation or three percent let's say right now minus the four percent inflation right so in other words you hedged against inflation because you had your money in the stock market i'm giving you reasons why you want to make sure you plug that thousand dollars into the stock market and you hopefully offset any inflation and you gained more interest on your money than say inflation ate it up now inflation I know can be high, especially for the volatile things, food, energy, et cetera, right? But typically, the return on investment in the stock market is higher than the return and in the inflation rate, right? The problem you get into with if some, some things like, say, bonds, t typically the bonds, depending on what type of bonds, right? There's all different types of bonds, but typically bonds won't return if it's a high inflation year, two and a half or three percent, three and a half percent. A lot of your bonds may not return what inflation is. So, yeah, it's guaranteed money, but bonds are low risk, and they're low risk for a reason. We want to take the higher risk by going into the stock market. H higher risk, higher or higher risk, higher reward, right? Just keep that in mind, right? The other beauty about investing your thousand dollars in the stock market is some companies pay a dividend. Some companies pay these special distributions called dividends, right? And these dividends payments can they can supply you, provide you with regular income and put money in your pocket, right? Or they can I like to take dividends and reinvest all dividends, right? But if so if you reinvest dividends, you're talking about ballooning your compound interest over a long period of time, right? If you reinvest. But that's another beauty of making sure you take your thousand dollars and put it in the stock market. So that's the first thing. And the first place we want to think of think, thing we want to think about with our thousand dollars, put it in the stock market, right? So let's look at let's let's talk about real quick some of the historical performance of the market, right? Because the thousand dollars you have, guys, you, or ten thousand or twenty thousand you have, you want that thing to grow, right? What are the chances it'll grow and make more money for you? The average stock market return over the last 100 years is close to 10%, right? In the last one uh, century or so, 100 years or so, and as measured by the S&P index, which S&P, I didn't think, I don't think S&P came around, S&P 500 until like the 1950s or something. Before that, it was the S&P 200 and something, right? But in some years, the market returns are more than 10%, and in other years, the returns are a lot less, right? So the average stock market, though, even in the last 30 years, the average stock market return is about 9.9%, right? Roughly according to like SoFi and some other places. But when you consider in inflation and you adjust that for inflation, we got to always adjust for inflation, guys, because you'll hear people all the, all the time say, hey, I got a 10% return, got 12% return, but they're not adjusting for inflation when they talk like that. You have, to adjust, you have to adjust for inflation. So in the last 30 years, adjusted for inflation, I think it was, and I'll look at it here, I think it was 7.2%, 7.22% when it when adjusted for inflation, which is really important, okay? So when somebody tells you, oh, that's getting an 11% return, always ask them, or what about if you adjust for inflation over 10 years, right? So about 10% is what, in the last 30 years, I say 10%, 9.9 is basically 10%, but only about 7% when adjusted for inflation. Listen, 7% return on your money ain't bad. It's much better than sticking it under the, the mattress and having it erode and get nothing in return, right? I mean, that's fair to say, right? Keep this in mind, though. 100 years, 
the this is important. This is an important statistic, so you guys got to know. In in a in the last one hundred years, the annual stock market return was only between eight percent and twelve percent in only eight out of a hundred years. Okay, hope you guys heard me on that. Only eight years out of the last one hundred years have the, has the stock market actually returned between eight percent and twelve percent. What that means is a lot of those years, the stock market was returning 5%, 7%, 8%, I'm sorry, 6%, right? Under 8%. And a lot of those years, the stock market has returned 13%, 15%, 18%. So there's some volatility that you have to be ready for with your $1,000 or $10,000, whatever you have. There's some volatility that you have to get ready for. Last year, 2022, or in 2022, the S&P was down like 18.1%, right? It was way down, right? I think this year to date, it might be up around because we had a last, you know, the last month or two has been horrible, which October is always traditionally the worst stock market month. Always. In the history of the stock market, October is always the worst. Keep that in mind, guys, as you see stocks go down right now. But eight years out of 100 years, between 8% and 12%, a lot of volatility, but you got to be willing to stomach that, right? Good years, it's going to be over 12%, booming, like we had 2014, 15, 13, right? Booming. Bad years, like, you know, 2022, well under 8%. This is the scary part of the stock market investing most people go around and don't really talk about. They talk about grow your money, grow your money, but what about losing your money? You could you can lose some money as well. I'm going to address this 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 whole thing in a moment but why uh, in a little deeper way. But this is the volatility that scares so many people away from the stock market. Let me share my screen with you guys. I want to show you something since we're talking about that. If you give me just a second, guys. I'm going to share my screen with you. And just show you something. I like sharing my screen. All right, so here we go, guys. If you guys can see that, I'm sure you can. Now, when you look at this screen, guys, <laughs> this is, by the way, the Dow Jones, by the way. And the Dow Jones is a, a, a fair representation, right? Stock or uh, S&P, NASDAQ, Dow Jones, right? It's a fair representation. This is the performance of the Dow Jones over the last... 100 years, right? And the years are down here. You might not be able to see them very well. But this is what it's returned in the last 100 years, okay? So all of all the others would mirror this, right? If we did a total market, it would mirror this, NASDAQ, etc. For the most part, right? For the most part, what do you notice in this chart, guys? What do you notice? What's the one thing that pops out in this chart? A couple things pop out probably. But what's, what, what pops out? This is Dow Jones, by the way, 1900 to present. What pops out? Here's the years down here at the bottom. Right? What is popping out about this chart? And we know we see some things. Look at that. That's the great stock market crash, right? 1929 in that area, right? You got the war. You got all kinds of things, right? This was uh, 2008. Let me get rid of that. That's 2008. This is 2020 up here, right? But what do you notice about this chart, right? All right. Some of you are saying it, right? DLK says uptrend. Kevin, because the economy kept growing and, and, and of course, inflation, right, says Kevin. Red table t tablet talk, that it trends up generally. John Joe, it's moving up. Pete O, Goes up eventually. Laque Lakeisha, moving up. Uh, Preston, more ups than down. That's exactly right. I knew I had a super-duper intelligent uh, crowd here, a super-duper intelligent uh, base of folks here. The deal is this, guys. It always, for the most part, goes up over the long haul. This is why I'm a buy-and-hold person. Because, yeah, you're going to see some chinks in the armor. Boom, a dip right here. Boom, a dip right here. Down a couple of dips right here, right in here, right? Then you saw around 1982 right here. It dipped way down right here, went back up, dipped again, went up, dip, dip, dip. But generally speaking, generally speaking, this thing is going up, right? 
That's the whole point of buy and hold. You want to take a, 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 a you want to buy a stock right here, and you just you don't want to sell it when it dip right here, and when everybody panics right here, and everybody starts panicking right here. You just when people start panicking in these little dips you see right here, that's when you want to go out and buy because over the long haul, the thing is going to go up. But it's not going to go up so much in the short haul. Remember what I said. It's only been between 8 and 12% return in 8 of the last 100 years. But generally speaking, in the last 100 years, it's gone up tremendously. Right? It always goes up. Doesn't mean it always will in the short run. You know, last year, 2022 was down. 2023 is slightly up. 2024, down. Whatever it could be, right? It just means that over the if you're a long-term investor, it always has gone up. You And so... If you're, t if you're looking at your $1,000 or $10,000 or $30,000, this is why you want to be in the stock market long term, right? right? This is why long term investing is so important. If this thing ever goes down for a significant period of time, and when I say significant period of time, I mean, I mean four, five, six years in a row of super duper down, like we're all going to be in trouble. America will be in trouble. America will be gone as we know it today. Right. So as long as you think America is going to be here, this thing is going to be going up decade after decade after decade, maybe not year over year over year, but decade after decade after decade. Right. Again, over the years, ultimately, it sort of smooths out and it looks like an uptrend. Right. So if you're investing your one thousand dollars and expecting to trade it and move it around and pull it for out from time to time and all that type of stuff then you can expect to see some losses. But if you decide to leave it in the market, stock market, the chances of you receiving gains are greatly in increased. Another reason to be in the stock market long haul. Don't get me wrong. There's risk. There's times when it goes down. Right. And that takes me to my really to my second suggestion with your one thousand dollars to make your money, make more money. Right. The second suggestion with your one thousand dollars to make it grow is to spread it out. Right. Spread it out. Stop sharing real quick, guys. So. Spread it out. OK. I want you guys to take this with you. If you don't get anything else out of this video, I want you to take this one thing with you. Please dig your teeth into what I'm about to say. OK. You need to diversify your overall investment portfolio. Please, please, please. Right? Like my man James Brown said years ago. Please, please, please. Diversify. Diverse, meaning two things, okay? That means two things, not just, not just one thing. It means, one, don't store all your money in only one stock. We know that, right? Please don't do that. Don't take and put all of your money only in on AT&T or only on Amazon or only on Google, right? Or Alphabet. Don't do that. But it means this also. Don't store all your wealth. And we're beyond the $1,000 right now. I'm talking to the people that might have 100000 or 200 or 400 Don't store all your wealth only in the stock market. Okay. Prime example, in 2022, the S&P was down, I said, negative 18% or something like that, right? For the year in 2022, it was way down, right? A lot of buying opportunities, but this, this, is a huge, took a, this, is, this was a huge hit on a lot of people's portfolio. Me personally, I think I lost probably close to $80,000 or more on paper, right, myself. But guess what? Because about half of my portfolio was in real estate, I gained another $90,000 in real estate. When real estate skyrocketed and rental rates went up and the values went up, home equity, equities went up, right? So real estate acted as a hedge against the down year in the stock market for me and probably for a lot of you guys, right? My net worth increased in 2022 despite a, a bad, you know, negative 18% S&P down in the stock market, the whole, and I'm again, I'm, I'm talking to the person outside of the $1,000 right now. 
The whole purpose of investing in the stock market is to make your money make more money so that you'll be financially free and financially invincible. But also you want to diversify that and not only be there so that if the stocks fall, you got something else to fall back on. If real estate crashes, you got the stock market or you got a business, right? Have, have a little bit of diversity, diversification in your money, right? You want to set up life in general. We're talking life in general so that if your job fires you tomorrow or you say the wrong thing or make the wrong decision and they let you go for some reason, you got a nest egg, emergency money, cash, right? You got some money in the stock market. You got some money in real estate, right? You want to be diversified in where you actually are investing your money, right? So there's two things with diversification. Never put all your money in one stock and also diversify your actual investment choices, okay? But again, spread your money out to various investments. Let's go back to the $1,000 person. If you have $1,000 or $10,000 you're looking to invest in, Spread your money out to various investments and various stocks and various ETFs and various index funds, mutual funds, etc. Right now, of course, if you have mutual funds and you know index funds, mutual funds, what, what have you, those are a basket of funds anyway. Right, we know that. Right, so you want your your thousand dollars to kind of be spread around. If you buy individual stocks, make sure you buy a bunch of stocks. That's the point. Right. So that's the second thing to consider with your $1,000. All right. So it's, it's also why something like dollar cost averaging is important. Don't just invest the $1,000 one time. Keep feeding the beast, right? Keep feeding that stock market with a steady diet of constant. So remember what I did. What I did in the down markets or times when the stock market is down and also when the market is booming is the same thing. Just kept investing. That's pretty much what dollar cost averaging is. Just keep putting money in at regular intervals, right? constantly no matter what the stock is doing you're not reading stocks every day oh is it down is it up you just keep putting money in right just means investing the same amount of money in a in a regular targeted investment or security or stock my stock stock or or index fund or etf regularly regardless of the price i think it was um benjamin graham right back in the 30s or 40s when he wrote the intelligent investor who first coined that DCA, dollar cost averaging. So please make sure you're dollar cost averaging. Again, don't put all your eggs, eggs in one basket. And don't put all your investments in one thing. Don't have all your money wrapped up in gold or all your money wrapped up in crypto. Right? Spread it around, please. It's the most important thing I can stress. If you don't take anything else from this video, take that. So again, my first suggestion with your $1,000 is to be in the market, stock market. I gave you reasons why. My second suggestion is to diversify your stock portfolio and all of your appreciating assets. So with this $1,000, I again suggest you spread it, spread it around. Unless you get in the market and expect to do some day trading to earn money, buying low, selling high throughout the course of any given day, right? Sitting at a computer and all that good stuff. Again, the stock market is a long game. When I say long game, more than five years, right? There's just volatility, and I showed you guys the chart to say, hey, over the long haul, it goes up. So I'm not, and I'm not, I don't want to put down day traders. If you're a day trader in here, there's nothing wrong with day trading if that's what you want to do, but that's not really something I do, right? I don't like looking at big old screens all day. Uh, but, you, and you can, you can make some money in day trading, and you can lose a, a ton of money in day trading as well, right? So I just want to say that. Now, also, I want to say this. Keep in mind, guys, when we talk about stocks and bonds, you're going to hear people talk about paper assets. Okay. I like, and, and so I like, we all say paper assets um, because you really don't lose money or gain money in the stock market until you sell, right? When you sell, that's when you lose money, right? Or when you, you get, you know, so it's, it's all done on paper. You're only making and losing money on paper, but a paper asset is really just the ownership of, Something that's not a physical asset, like real estate, land, et cetera, corn, right? Um, a painting, right? Jewelry, gold, right? Gold, physical gold, right? So paper asset, you'll hear that a lot. That's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, et cetera. So before I go to suggestion three, let me stop. Appreciate you, Jacob Rothenberg 
for the super chat. Jacob said, I have a $250,000 in a 5.2% yield account, high yield account. Looks like a high yield savings account. Should I take on more risk with putting money into an index fund? Depends on how old you are, Jacob. If you're looking to, if you're in that stage where you're trying to pull this money right now and you can't stand any volatility over the next year or so, then sure, start, start, start withdrawing some money, pulling some money. But if, if you're in it for the long haul, right? If you're in it for the long haul, drop that money in a good index fund. And I can, I can give you a bunch of good index funds, but drop that money in an in index fund, right? He's making negative 20,000 per month. No plans of buying a house in the next two. Make, I think you say you're making 20000 per month, so no plans of buying a house in the next one to two years. So basically, Jacob said, um, should I take on more risk with putting money in an index fund? I like index funds. I love index funds. I'm going to talk about them in a little bit. I love index funds. There's just a basket of group, group of funds in a basket following a sector. I say personally that you look at some index funds, at least a portion of that extra money. Look at some index funds. Leave some in the high yield for your emergency, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80,000, whatever you feel comfortable with. But I would look at some index funds with that money. Absolutely. That's that's my opinion on that. Jacob, thanks so much for the super chat, man. I really, really super duper appreciate you on that. Um, so before I get to the to the suggestion, the third suggestion I want you to do with your $1,000 I need you guys to smash that like button for me. Really, really important, guys. If you're not a subscriber to this channel, please consider subscribing. What we do on this channel, we talk about the macro picture of money, the U.S. economy, what's going on with our dollar, inflation, et cetera, what the Fed is doing. We also dig into stocks more often. This is one of my very first videos talking really deeply about the, or deeper about the stock market, but we're going to do this quite a bit more. We also talk about Ways to manage your money. Be a better steward over your finances. We talk about ways to grow your money. We talk about side hustles to add additional income streams to your money. We talk about all things money in a lot of ways, guys. And so that's what we do on this channel. A regular guy bringing this stuff to you in plain language. Nothing fancy, right? Nothing overcomplicated. We're not going to be doing Forex on the video on this channel. We probably won't be doing a lot of options trading and things like that, right? Basics, because it really only takes the basics to build wealth. It doesn't take all the fancy stuff. Most people don't have the stomach and don't care about all the fancy stuff. They just want to know, how can I grow my money? How can I manage my money? How can I have money for, money for savings? And how can I have more money when I decide to retire and stop working? And that's what we do on this channel. So do me a favor and share this video. Again, the best way to support the channel is to share the video don't forget also, I'm a Mint Mobile guy. Check out Mint Mobile in the description box. They don't have a retail stores. They don't have uh, people they have to uh, pay to work out in the retail stores. So those, they pass those savings on to us. It's on the largest 5G network Mint Mobile is, right? So solid. If you want to save money on something as simple as your cell phone bill, right? We're talking about saving money. That's a nice way you can save some money is by jumping on something like Mint Mobile and grabbing their plans and using them, right? Really reliable as well. So that description, check out that link in the description box below. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber, guys. I really would appreciate it. The channel's grown tremendously, and I owe smart people like you guys. All right, let's go to suggestion number three. With your $1,000 to make your money make more money, Right? You want to know where you're going to invest your money, where you're going to invest your $1,000, right? Now, we can talk, and I want you guys to do me a favor, by the way. Hey, thanks, uh, Marcella Cronin, for becoming a subscriber. Glad to have you here, guys. By the way, I will do a little Q&A towards the end here, or not the end, but second half. We'll do a little Q&A, right? So put a Q by your question when that time comes. But tell me in the, in the chat box, guys, where do you guys actually, what apps do you use to invest money, if you use any apps? Okay, let me know in the chat chat below, guys. What apps are you using? Of course, we know there's things like, um, you know, Robinhood. Uh, what's what's another one? Webull is a big one right now, right? Um, Stash. I think there's something called Stashed. There was something called Stock Stockpile or something like that. Um, Betterment, right? Um, I've heard of uh, one that. Um, called Moomoo, right? So what, what, what 
apps are you guys using? Me personally, right now, I don't use an app. Okay. I don't use that. But, you know, apps are just portals and that's cool. You're still buying the regular st stock when you use an app. Um, some folks said Rob, uh, use Robin Hood. Okay. Okay. Being sarcastic with Robin Hood, but uh, Fidelity, uh, Fidel some of the larger brokerage houses have apps too, right? So Fidelity has a, an app that's pretty popular as well. All right. I don't invest in, uh, you know, I don't like to use my phone and stuff to do investing. So um, and you may be saying, well, a phone is more secure than a laptop, right? You could be telling the truth about that, right? But, uh, I load my computer with so much security software. It's ridiculous, but I take, I take what I do on my laptop more, more serious. I'm old school like that. Call me old, right? Um, so I, I don't like to do a lot of stuff on my phone and so forth, but apps are okay. Nothing wrong with it, right? Uh, somebody says Acorn, Vanguard. Okay. Uh, TD Ameritrade, Ameritrade uh, Charles Schwab is very traditional, absolutely. And I think Charles Schwab has a good high-rated app as well, I believe. Help me out if you know that for sure. Um, but Fidelity, again, we got a Vanguard person, uh, Derica, uh, says Vanguard, uh, Robin Hood, right? Schwab on the phone and laptop. Schwab is always a, uh, like I say, Schwab is pretty solid. Um <laughs> she said, hi, my internet dad. Hey, how you doing, internet daughter? I appreciate you. All right, so some of the larger broker fronts. So what I'm saying is here, where are you going to be investing your $1,000? Where, where, where? You know, we always want to know that. Fidelity, larger broker firm, firms. Charles Schwab, larger. Vanguard, one of my favorites. I, I don't endorse, you know, I'm not a, a paid endorser for Vanguard, but I like Vanguard, right? J.P. Morgan Wealth, their wealth division. I think Merrill Lynch was bought out a few years, a while back by Bank of America. Uh, I think they go by Merrill Edge or something like that. I don't know what they are. Merrill Lynch is kind of confusing to me in terms of their structure, who, who owns them and so forth now. And then you got like interactive brokers. Uh, nobody mentioned E-Trade. E-Trade is one that's also out there, pretty big one. Someone mentioned TD Ameritrade, I think. Um, oh, Schwab bought out TD Ameritrade. Okay, fantastic. Um so me personally, again, I use Vanguard. So with your $1,000 to make your money, make more money, you have to make a determination what's best for you. Usually what happens is people get on a certain platform. And the thing I love about these platforms, these brokerage platforms, be they apps or platforms, they're all very educational, right? If you go to Schwab, Schwab is going to educate you. There's a lot of education about what to do, what are stocks, what are bonds, how to do this. A lot of things on Schwab website. If you go to Vanguard, same thing, a lot of education on those websites you have to do the research we're still in suggestion three about where you're going to be investing your thousand dollars what platform what company you're going to be investing through you have to do your research about the companies doing whatever their ratings are right what ha get on their platforms right see what feels comfortable see what feels natural to you Right. I started using Vanguard a long time ago, so I'm still a Vanguard fan. Some of you may have been on Fidelity, Fidelity a long time ago, so you're still a Fidelity plan. Do your research on these different apps and platforms, and you figure out which one is best for you. Someone mentioned um, uh, Scott Trade bought out TD Ameritrade. I say, oh, so somebody says, I use Ally. Ally or Ally. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, somebody says, I use Stash. Right. There's a lot of them out there. What you feel comfortable with, these are just portals again, guys. The, whenever you invest through a brokerage firm, through an app, right, uh, you're, just, you're still buying the actual stock. Just keep that in mind. Now, some apps I do know, sometimes they make it a little more difficult to leave them, right? So read the fine print and all that good stuff as well. Um, but I like the platforms that are the old school brokerage platforms, the Schwab's. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, J.P. Morgans, the uh, Fidelity, and so forth, right? Now, let's go to the fourth suggestion I have for you with your $1,000. This is the big one. This is the big kahuna right here, right? The fourth suggestion with your $1,000, what you're going to invest in to make your money make more money and get started, right? How to invest your $1,000 is what are you going to be investing in? What should you invest in? This is the big one, the big kahuna, right? Now, I suggested earlier to you that you, should, you, you invest in a mix of things, right? Not just one stock. Inside the stock market, there are a lot of different types of things you can invest in. Let's talk real briefly about them, okay? There's single stocks, right? 
single stocks that can be bought and traded. Those price fluct those prices of those single stocks fluctuate throughout the trading day. Right? They may start trading at $89 a share. They may end the day at $87 per share. Or they may end the day at $92 per share. That's a single stock offering from a single company. If you decide to invest your $1,000 into a single stock, I suggest you do 10 different single stocks. Spread your risk around and do your research. Or you can invest in a mutual fund. Right? A mutual fund is a bucket of 80 different stocks or a bucket of 200 different st individual stocks in that bucket. You're investing in the whole bucket. Not, and inside that bucket, a called a mutual fund, is individual stocks, right? Mutual funds have portfolio managers that select which stocks they want to put in the bucket, take out of the bucket, put in the bucket, take out of the bucket. And they're usually more expensive for a regular mutual fund because you have to pay the fees that usually inclu include the payment to the fund manager, right? So... Something to think about with mutual funds, right? Of course, they have same-day execution. All investors, when you invest in a mutual fund, all investors, you get the same price at the end of each day, right? It doesn't fluctuate like a single stock, right? I look at mutual funds, like I said, as just simply a bucket of stocks. Don't, don't, don't overcomplicate that thing that are managed by a fund manager, period. Now, there's... There's different types of mutual fund. An index fund, which I prefer, is a type of mutual fund. An index fund, where you could put your $1,000 to see your money make more money, is a specific, again, it's a bucket of stocks, right? For example, the S&P 500, that's, that's, five, that's not 500 stocks, it's a little over 500 stocks, but that's a bucket of 500 stocks, Right? And you can take and buy an index fund that, that, that tracks that bucket of stocks, right? And you, and you need much less management to manage an index fund because it's just following a bucket of stocks or group of, of, of stocks, right? So it's usually index funds are usually lower fees, low, lower cost than a, than a mutual, than a traditional mutual fund, although index funds are a type of mutual funds, right? It's, index funds are not actively managed, okay? So it's, it's more of a set it and forget it. You don't want to watch it every day, but you can watch it every day if you want. Then, of course, you got things like more what they call um, fixed, fixed income, fixed income funds, right? And those are things that really they're lower risk, so they give you a lower reward ultimately, right? Like bonds and, you know, bond ETFs or bond index funds or low-grade corporate bonds, right? Low-grade corporate bonds, right? <laughs> I said to say that twice. Not the, not, not the volatile, uh, low, lower low-grade junk bonds. I'm not saying that, right? I'm saying just, uh, th so those, those are fixed funds. And then you got what they call like, they call them uh, equity funds, right? That are usually, they, they call like small cap, mid cap, large cap, right? Or there are stocks that you have a group of stocks that could be defined by what their ultimate, uh, what they want to achieve, what their objective is, right? Uh, income funds or growth funds, or you have what they call dividend paying funds, right? So there's a lot of different places where you could actually invest your money. You could do ETFs, exchange traded funds, right? Again, ETFs are just a basket of funds as well that's tied to a specific index and that are passively managed. And you can get into ETFs, a lot of times, low barrier to entry, right? But ETFs trade on the stock market. So ETFs price will be $89 per share of that ETF, that basket of funds at the start of the day, might end up at $92 by the end of the day. ETFs are just a basket of funds that's traded throughout the day, just like single stocks right? Bought and sold throughout the day. And so they change their price throughout the day. That's what ETFs are, do, right? And, you, and so on some platforms, you can purchase these in fractional shares. You could purchase them or some places you got to purchase them in whole shares, right? But the thing about ETFs, the reason I like ETFs a lot, because they don't require any type of minimal investment, typically. 
right? ETFs are a really good place to start with your thousand dollars. If there is, it's kind of low hanging fruit, right? Now I'm, I'm a Vanguard person. So, you know, Vanguard has lots of great ETFs, right? Right. I could name, you know, VOO and VGT and um, BTSAX, et cetera, right? VYM, which is, you know, so I could name a bunch of good ones, right? Things that I buy, right? Because I'm a long-term investor and I understand that for the long haul, the stock market is going to go up, continue to grow. So if the stock market is going to go up and continue to grow, then guess what? If I have a basket of funds that I invest in, like an ETF, I have a basket of funds that's only tracking the, a sector of the market and that sector of the market is expected to grow over time, why do I have to pay the additional fees for the to have it actively managed? Matter of fact, mutual funds that are actively managed, you guys, some of you know this, mutual funds that are actively managed, they typically um, do worse. They underperform index funds, right? Over the long haul, right? So, because me guys, I'm not a big stock watcher, meaning I don't like to sit at the computer and watch a bunch of stocks and the ticker symbols and all that and the fluctuations on a, each individual stock. That's not, that's not what I have. I have a job, right? I'm like most of you guys. I have a job. So I got to work my job, right? I don't have time to sit before those computers. Um, I'm a big fan of, of a more passive approach to the stock market as opposed to being overly aggressive. Overly aggressive approach to the stock market, it don't mean you're necessarily winning, OK, because they can take a group of, you know, uh, you know, hound dogs and have them pick stocks and and they can come out and do better than you who are stressing and actively managing and all over it every single day and watching the stock market and trying to pick in time. Right. So it's all that's all a big that's all a big stressor, in my opinion, for me. Now, if you like that stuff, great, go for it. But me, I'm a buy buy and hold guy. I do have some individual stocks, but I actually I actually purchased some more individual stocks a few days ago when I went shopping, right? I, you know, read it, did some research and went shopping. So with your $1,000 to make it make money, I suggest you take these four suggestions I provided and make your money make more money. When you're deciding what to invest your money in, in a bunch of individual stocks, ETFs, index funds, mutual funds, Think about the things that you know about. What do you care about, right? What do you see coming down the, the pipe in terms of long-term trends that are sustainable, right? Long, again, long-term trends in the world around us that are sustainable, that are coming. And once they come, they're going to be here for a while because they're changing the game, right? Maybe it's AI for some of you looking at maybe AI stocks, right? And, and again, if you spread your money around. But these are the types of things that you should be investing in for the long haul. A few, few other things I want to mention before we do a little Q&A. Don't panic. Don't get fearful with your $1,000 or any money you plan to invest. Invest in, number, another thing is this, invest in the low times and understand that when people are fearful, I think it was a famous quote from, uh, was it Warren Buffett? You guys tell me. When, you, when other people are fearful, you should be aggressive. Still dollar cost averaging and still being aggressive in those times. Those are buying opportunities. The last two weeks, We've had low points in a lot of stocks, in a lot of stocks, guys. Do your research. Those are buying opportunities, right? The greatest players get really, really focused. I don't care if it's the sports, right? A few weeks ago, we talked about baseball, basketball, whatever you watch, soccer. But it's those panic times, those really tense times that players that are successful, most successful, they slow down, take their time, and things get clearer to them. And that's what you need to do in terms of your stock market investing. I want to see your $1,000 grow and provide you with good returns over many years to come, but you got to not be fearful and scared and nervous. A nervous, and, a nervous, scared, fearful investor will make mistakes all the, all the time. Slow down, take your time, dollar cost average, keep investing. You put in your $1,000, but keep investing after that to help your money grow, right? and recognize opportunities. Don't pull your money out constantly to go here and there, right? The best investing is long-term investing, right? And remember, spread it out. 
put your thousand dollars in several places, know your risk tolerance and invest in things that you understand. Let's talk guys. Let's talk. If it put a cue in, let me go back over to the chat guys. Let's put a cue, put a cue in there guys. And let's have a little bit of conversation. We're just opening the door on this channel to stock market and stock market talk and stock market investing. We're going to do a lot more on the markets coming up guys. Um, and let me know in the comments if you enjoy this type of content on this channel. If you enjoy talking about the market, talking about stocks, and, and I'm, a, I'm a Warren Buffett fan, right? Truth be told, I'm a Warren Buffett guy, right? So this is really basic common sense stuff when it comes to investing. It's not anything going to be fancy. Uh, I'm not going to do anything super superlative. I'm not going to tell you, hey, watch this video of mine and I'm going to get you $10,000 next month. I'm going to get you $10,000 next. That's part of my voice. I do voiceovers on the side. That's part of my voiceover voice, right? Watch this video, and we're going to do what we can to make you earn. No, we're not going to do that on this channel, right? We're going to take it and do things simple, simple, and so everybody can understand it. Not anything fancy, right? By the way, and I mentioned this to you. I want to make sure it's clear. The stock market, if you have some downtime this weekend, do a little research. The S&P 500 entered into what they called a correction, I think at the close of Friday, guys, the close of yesterday's trading. And so a correction just means usually it's a 10% uh, fall from a high, right? I think the S&P in uh, early August or late July was around, it's fallen 10% since then, the S&P 500, right? And that's what they call a correction, right? They got these terms and stuff to make it sound sound uh, something, you know, fancy. It's, it's in correction territory, Right. So it's, it's a 10% drop from a recent high. And the recent high for the S&P was back around in the beginning of August or so. So, and also note this. I think I read that the S&P 500 entered into its worst two-week decline in the last couple of weeks. Uh, two-week decline of the year, so far this year, this, this um, calendar year. The worst two-week decline. What does that mean? Most of you said you put a one in the chat and you said, hey, I'm an investor. What does that mean for us as investors? It doesn't mean we get nervous and we get scared and we start getting fearful. It means stocks are on sale. A lot of stocks are undervalued right now. And if stocks are undervalued, those are purchasing opportunities for us as investors. Don't pass these things up. If you've got an additional $1,000 right now and you want to make it make more money, you need to be looking at the ETFs, the index funds, the mutual funds, the individual stocks that are down right now as of the making of this video. It may not be this way coming up. The Fed is about to give us their take on whether they're going to raise the federal funds rate. And if they raise the federal funds rate, you're going to, you're going to probably see a slight rally in the stock market. Stocks are going to go up. So when you've seen things close at a low, on Friday, this past Friday, yesterday, you, that's opportunity for you to get in there first thing Monday morning and start buying. Or you know, what, my point is, guys, don't let opportunities pass you up. So if I was, if I had a thousand dollars, I'd be shopping at the stock store. Now is the time, right? You could maybe take, and I'll get to some of your questions in just a moment. Now you could maybe take that that thousand dollars. Let me just give you a quick scenario. I'll just, off the top of my head, take that $1,000, go look at the S&P 500 ETF called VOO. We're on Vanguard here. Take a look at VYM, which is more of your dividend stock or your dividend ETF. It pays a dividend. You can reinvest a dividend. Take a, look at, take a look at some blue chippers, some bigger blue chips, you know, bigger blue chip stocks. Look at some mid cap. Look at some small cap, right? And maybe, you know, Look at some ETFs, some other ETFs, right? That are in sectors that you want to be in, that you like. Maybe you're in the healthcare industry, right? Maybe you're in the pharmaceutical industry. Maybe you're in the, um, in the, um, another, you know, automotive industry. And you know, some, you know, some things that's going on and say, man, I think that's going to be pretty good. Let me go ahead and go with GM, Ford, Toyota, whatever it may be, right? The point is, is that, you can take that $1,000, you can split it in several ways to spread things out a little bit, spread across your risk, 
to invest in things you know, and then after you invest your $1,000, start putting in $50 a month, $50 every two weeks, whenever you get paid, right? And do that $50 no matter what happens in the, in the, in the, in the, in the market. Let me look get to a few questions here. All right, so please put a cue in there if you can, guys. I appreciate it. Helps me quickly identify it. Uh, Preston, give me a shout. Let's, let's talk. You can look in the description box and you can contact me. My contact information is there. Uh, Terrence said, how long have I been in? I've been in the market since usually with my job since the nineties, right? With, since the mid nineties. Um, and why do you think only 15% of the world invests? Okay. So what makes people fearful? It, it's a natural thing to be fearful. When you're investing in the stock market, you got to kind of go against your natural inclinations of fear, okay? Um, let's see here. Somebody said it's buying time. Yep, question. What do you think about REITs that only buy mortgages? They pay dividends of about 8%, which is a lot more than regular REITs, but the risk is uh, if the mortgages don't get paid. You always got to be careful about REITs. Read the fine print. When you're investing in REITs, real estate investment trust, read the fine print, know what they invest in and know that you're comfortable with what they invest in. If you're not comfortable because you look at the volatility that's involved with mortgage, with, with, with REITs that only buy mortgages, then that's not a place you need to be, right? If you're uncomfortable with that level of risk, right? But if you're 25, 30 years old, you got age and time on your side and you got some extra money to put towards that type of REIT, go for it right? But otherwise, read the fine print when it comes to REITs. Look at the historical performance, but not just historical performance. That's only one thing. Look at how the company is, look at how the, the REIT is ran, right? Look at how they performed. And we're not going to get into too much PE ratios and stuff on this video. We'll hit that maybe some other time, but those are ways you need to eval evaluate if you're comfortable with it, if you understand it, right? Go for it. If not, and you can't tolerate that type of risk, don't go for it. Let's see here. Somebody said 10 year bond spike. Yep. Kenny said, I believe I heard 90% of the time actively managed fund un funds underperform. Yes, that's about right. Most times the actively managed funds underperform the index funds, the true index funds that are just following a sector. Right. And that's why me personally, that's why I like index funds as well. Um, yeah. Terrence said the S and P is only up a little bit over 7.39% year to date. Now, if you looked at that, a month ago, that was about 11% year to date. Two months ago, that was about 13% year to date. So it's coming down. Again, let me tell you guys this. September, October, September, October, specifically October, excuse me, is, is the month where stocks typically do the worst out of all the other 12 months, all the other 11 months. October's the worst. Keep that in mind for life. Uh, Scott, you're welcome, uh, Scott. Good to have you here, man. Um, uh, Hucklebuck said VHT. Um, let's see. Thoughts on dividend focus investing like ETF, SCHD. SCHD, I think e SCHD is Schwab's um, uh, dividend performing fund, right? Dividend performing ETF is Sh from, Sh from Schwab, Schwab, SCHD. Um, currently have 170K in ETFs, making 10K yearly on dividends, then dripping back. Good. I love to go back and take your dividends and reinvest for the compounding effect. Over the course of 15, 20 years, the compounding, of, compounding effect of dividends is huge. So you always want to, in my opinion, take advantage of that. Unless you, you know, you want, you want to pull some dividends and, you know, live off of. That's cool too, right? Better than credit card points. That's for sure. But don't, boom. Okay, Hucklebuck said V and Q. V and Q is pretty good too. Um, rights are REITs are a little bit dicey. Okay, I get that. Uh, one good book about uh, the Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Yep, that's the old school one. Scott, thanks for bringing that into the chat. Appreciate it, guys. Put a Q. Let's answer some questions. Let's talk stock market, and uh, we'll see what you guys have. I got a few more things I want to share, but I just want to see what you guys have for me. Um, let's see here. Information collection pad, post. People in my age group don't use apps. <laughs> you can go down a, to a mutual fund company's website and fill online forms. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what age group you're in, information collect, collection post, but yeah, I'm an old school guy. I'm not a big app guy. I try to keep as few apps as possible on my phone. Um, so, you know, I don't do too much apps with, when it comes to banking and so forth. Uh, John said, how do I invest in the S&P 500? 
I have a 401k with Fidelity. Should I open another brokerage account? If you, if you're, if John, if you're with Fidelity, Fidelity has a um, a stock that or a stock, an ETF or an index fund that covers their the entire market. You just got to figure out what that ticker symbol is and look for it to invest in it. Um, you don't have to open up another brokerage account. Some people say you should spread around in different brokerage accounts, right? Have a little bit in Fidelity, a little bit in Charles Schwab, a little bit. And that's cool, too, if you want to do that. You don't necessarily have to do that, but you can if you want to. And so I don't think, John, that you have to open up another account at another uh, brokerage firm. I think you can, in Fidelity, you can invest um I think you can invest in Fidelity, although you still have you have a 401k with Fidelity, right? Of course, you know, check your rules and all that good stuff. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so you've got some good stuff working. Fantastic. And so that's the other thing, guys. Research, 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 right? A lot of different ra ways to research your stock. Obviously, we, I don't want to dig into P.E. ratios and earnings per share and all that stuff in this video, but just to say that you want to look at more things than just the numbers, but you do want to look at the numbers of a, firm, of a company, right? There's more to a company than just what's on paper, but you do want to look at some of their forms that the SEC requires them as public, publicly traded companies to file and to put out there to the public. Because as a publicly traded company, you ought to be able to see what their numbers are. What's their revenue, their top line, their bottom line, right? All that good stuff is stuff you, ought, that's, you have access to, right? Hucklebuck said FXAIX. That's the total market uh, fund ETF for uh, for Vanguard. Fantastic. Hiawatha, Coleman, you're welcome. I appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, I'm an index fund guy. But let's see, guys. Not many more questions. So I'm going to – we're over uh, – let's see here. We're over an hour, which is good. But that – the whole gist – gist, gist – not sure how to pronounce that word. But the whole point – of today's 11 a.m. talk was how to make your money make more money. Getting started. How to take your $1,000 and grow your $1,000. How to make it make more. Because listen, this is what people who build wealth do. And we, on this channel, we want to be with, we want to be on the side of people that are building wealth as opposed to the side of people losing wealth, Right? It's not to shame the people that lose wealth, but it's to say, hey, how can we position ourselves to have more income down the road, to retire with more down the road? We got to do smart things with money. And it, it, it doesn't have to be complicated, just smart things with money. Stock market investing is a smart thing to do with your money, but you got to do it in a smart way, right? You got to do it in a way that says, okay, how can I build my money over time and not look at it to say, oh, I want to get in and get out, jump in, jump out, trade, no. chill, right? Just chill, just relax, right? Relax, calm down, breathe, woosah, whatever they say, right? Take your time with the $1,000 you have or 10000 Some of you are sitting on 25000 50000 100000 right? The long haul. And I know for some of you, it can be testy because some of you are 65 years old and you're pulling from this money. And right now, you're seeing the money dip. I totally understand it. I'm getting close to that age range myself, right? So I get it. But I'm saying what rich people do, well, I'm sorry, what wealthy people do, not necessarily rich, but what wealthy people do is they take that depreciating asset called cash, depreciating asset called that $1,000 worth of cash that you have. They take that depreciating asset and they flip it. And what do they put it in? They put it in an appreciating asset. That's how you make money on this planet, right? You take it low and you make it go high. You take that cash, you turn it into real estate. You turn it into stock market with the trend of going up, right? The right places, tried and true places, right? Maybe you're saying, hey, I want to invest in the magnificent se magnificent seven, right? Well, that's cool, right? They're, 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 somebody asked me a question about that the other day. They said, what, what do you think about the Magnificent Seven, right? What the Magnificent Seven is, if you can't, you guys don't know, is the seven largest pieces of the S&P 500, the seven companies, right? 
that are that make up the largest piece. They make up, I don't know what the exact percentage is. It's slipped my mind. But these seven companies make up like maybe 30% or more of the S&P 500. Maybe more than that. Google, Alphabet, Amazon. Uh, there's seven of them, right? I don't know where they are. Maybe I can find them on my internet here. But there's seven of them that make it up. Somebody said, what do you think about just investing in, in those seven companies? That's cool, but they remind me of what used to be called back in the 50s and 60s, I think the 50s, the nifty thrifty, uh, the, 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 the nifty 50, the nifty 50, where there was 50 companies that were, you couldn't lose if you invest in these companies, right? So be careful about that. Maybe you can find, I know Vanguard has an index fund that is that has a lot of those funds in there, but it's not totally based on those funds because some guys, what the, the, the top, the top 10 companies to invest in starting in about 2035, the year 2035, are going to be different than the top 10 companies to invest in today. More than likely. It, they could very well be different. So you look at these magnificent, magnificent seven companies, it may change in the next five, 10 years. We don't know who's emerging in the year 2025, I'm sorry, 2035, 2025, 2040. We don't know. So, yeah, you can invest in the Magnificent Seven, but just keep in mind that there's a whole lot of firms that are doing well as well besides those big seven firms. All right. Um, Miss Ray is good. Miss Ray, Miss Rosie. Good day, Eric. Thank you so much for sharing. She said, question, what supportive financial advice would you give to someone who is learning about personal finance investment? This is what I can tell you, Miss Rosie. If you're learning, if you're new, read as much as you can. Research as much as you can. Learn as much as you can. You should be reading a finance book a month or a finance book every two weeks on the stock market, on investing, on the ETFs, on in index funds, right? You have to take in a lot of new knowledge, and you can do it. This thing right here we call a brain can do a whole bunch of stuff that we, we don't even test it the way it should be tested, right? So you got to take in a lot of new information. That's the first thing you want to begin to do. New information, right? Because new input it's going to help new output. It's going, to, it's going to change the output and change behavior. That's the first thing I would suggest you do. Um, somebody said, I started being busy with money at the beginning of this year. I spent money first on my house. Now I have money in actively managed uh, fund because I had no clue. Cool. Okay, that's cool. You're starting. Everybody got to start somewhere. Nothing wrong with that. I, I encourage you and I support you starting. Let's see. Now I have boom, 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 some Bitcoin and also some ETFs. Yeah. Spread your portfolio out. Don't have half your money in Bitcoin. OK, that's my, my, my suggestion. Question. Does war make the entire stock, stock market go up or down? It all depends. Typically down. OK, but it could depend. Right. It could depend on a lot of different factors. OK, that's a that's a really big macroeconomic question. It depends on a lot of different factors. OK. But it could because it, it because war drains resources, right? War drains resources typically. And so whether that's, you know, it takes money to go fight a war. It takes money to go uh, deploy weapons. It takes money to go to fund this and fund that. And all those things, you know, that, that in the 1940s, you saw in the late 40s, you saw a little boom because we were, you know, manufacturing a bunch of go to go fight the war. But war typically drains resources. Okay. But it depends on a lot of different factors. Um, Apple is a part of the Magnificent Seven. Absolutely. Question, Schwab. Schwab is a wonderful brokerage firm to go to invest with. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, Hucklebuck said, yeah, Tesla, NVIDIA, Meta, Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft. Thanks for adding that, Hucklebuck. I appreciate it. Um, question, if AI is going to be the future, should we buy AI stocks? I'm not a stock advisor. I'm not a... I'm not a stock, uh, a, a stock, uh, a certified financial planner, but absolutely you should be buying things that are involving AI, but you shouldn't put all your money in AI, right? Spread it around. But if there's an ETF that is focused on AI, there's nothing wrong with buying some shares of that, right? Because we know that AI looks like it's going to be a part of a big part of the future in terms of technology. So sure, absolutely. You want to be doing some things in AI, but again, it don't put all your eggs in one basket. Pito said, I like commodities. Commodities are good. Uh, let's see here. Um, do -dum -do -dum, let's see. All right. Let's see. Question. Oh, okay. All right. So here's what I want to do, guys. You, uh, you're welcome, Miss Rosie. All right. 
I'm going to let it go for the day. I'm going to drop off for the day. I want to say also, listen, get your 24 laws of money in the description box. Share this video. And I need you guys to please do me a favor. Please smash the like button for me. Smash the like button for me. Very important, guys, that you hit that like button. And if you are watching this on replay on YouTube, feel free to drop a comment. I usually check all my comments, and I look through them, and I see what, what we got. I try to answer questions in the comments as well. So if you have a question that you didn't get out or didn't get answered in this video, video put it in the comment section on YouTube, and I'll be sure to get to it absolutely. Now, be careful about the spammers in the, in the comments, guys. They are everywhere, right? Last night, I did a scrub, a one-week scrub, and there was probably a 1,000 scammers in all of my comments across my channel that I scrubbed out, right? If you, if you run across a, sp a spammer, report them, right? But there's tons of them. You got to watch out for these people. It boggles my mind how people spend so much time trying to spam other people's content and information. But that's what happens out here, guys. Be very, very careful with the spammers and the contacts. I appreciate you guys more than you know. Thanks so much for hanging in with me. But that's what you should do with your $1,000 to make your money make more money in the stock market and getting started, all right? So, hey, guys, I always say this at the end of every broadcast. I appreciate you being here. If you're not a subscriber, please consider subscribing to the channel. The best person who's going to take care of the old you is not your grandchildren. It's not the president. It's not the nursing home or the adult uh, daycare center the best person who's going to take care of the old you is the young you today the person you are today all right hey take good care of yourself but also take care of other people until the next video peace